Episode 6, Part 10, Chapter 05 Chapter 5 Standing in the gateway of the village of Medil, Tifa once again rubbed her eyes in disbelief at the sight that lay before her. Medil was a small village, located on a three-alone island far to the south of the Condor Plains. It appeared on the world map in the Highwinds briefing room, but was so small and so seemingly insignificant she was surprised it was there at all. It was surrounded by a dense forest and they had almost missed it when they flew over the continent. Due to the density of the forest, it was impossible to land the high wind close to the village, and so they had to park the airship a few miles away and approach the village on foot, though Sid resented Katshi's use of park the airship. Tifa first learned about the existence of Medil after Red 13 took her aside and told her he remembered a tale his father, Seto, had told him once. The tale said that the life stream sometimes flowed to the surface in the south, but, sadly, he could not remember where. Curious to know more about the possibility of the life stream reaching the planet's surface, Tifa had left the high wind and entered Janan's lower town. At first she was nervous, since it had been barely a day since her dramatic escape from the upper levels. To her surprise, or perhaps not, really, since nobody on the lower levels liked or supported Shinra, no one stopped her. Asking around, Tifa had found very few people who could help her. She was thinking about giving up when one man suggested that she talk to Priscilla. Her heart racing so much she could not even spare a thank you, Tifa had run with all haste to the home of the little girl they had saved from drowning some months before, when their adventure was just beginning. Priscilla had been very startled when Tifa suddenly burst into her home. A rather ostentatious young girl, her manners had not changed at all since the last time they met, though she was much more agreeable when she finally recognized the young female fighter from Midgar. As Tifa had hoped, the young girl did know about the live stream, and had even been able to provide her with a location, it's Mr. Dolphin's playground. There's a three loaned island south of the continent. Thanking Priscilla with all her heart, after receiving a stern order from the girl to retrieve Cloud, since he was important to her, Tifa ran straight back to the high wind to pass on the information to Barrett and the others. So now, thanks to Priscilla's directions and Sid's quickly progressing piloting staff, Tifa stood in the gateway of Medil, the only village on this three loaned island. Barrett and the others were a small ways behind her, left behind in her eagerness to reach the village. Her first impression of Medil was... Surprise! Medil was completely unlike any village she had ever seen on her long journey across the continents. It was a small village, with only a handful of people living there. The houses were built of wood or stone rather than metal like homes in Midgar. Only one house stood out, for it was half-painted white a large building at the far end of the village. There were no Mako-powered buildings, no Mako reactors, no machinery at least not that she could see. The closest thing to a machine that she could see was a tall windmill near the village entrance, its wooden blades turning slowly in the gentle breeze that swept through the forest. People strolled through the village almost uncaringly, as though unaware of the events of the outside world. Ahoy! Hey, ain't you a beaut? Broken from her reverie, Tifa turned around. Near the windmill was an old man, resting his old bones against a wooden fence. His aged face was wrinkled and brown from the sun, his eyes bright and smiling, like his mouth. Tifa nodded her head and smiled back, accepting the compliment. The old man, pleased, nodded his head toward the village. This here's Medil, he told her. Though he was old his mind was sharp, and he could tell with a look that Tifa was new to these parts. It's a quiet little hot springs town. Just the perfect place for old folks like us to live out our lives. He raised his eyes to the sky, and the smile lessened to a frown. I hear that things ain't so peaceful on the outside. But here it's still nice and quiet. Tifa followed his gaze, to where the giant, fiery orb of meteor still hung in the sky, even in the day. The sky surrounding the orb was red, as though on fire. It was a blemish in the sky. Tifa lowered her gaze. With no reactors around to suck up the Mako, the land around Midil was rich and green. The people who lived here were content and happy. They did not need machines to run their lives, they made their own. Midil was an example of how life used to be, before Shinra and Soldier and Sephiroth. Tifa sighed and turned. The others were just coming up behind her, and Tifa began to walk into the village, once again lost in her thoughts. Did the others think she was silly, pursuing what could be a wild goose chase? Did they believe that Cloud had died back in the northern crater? Did they secretly wish that he had? No, that was silly, she told herself. Despite his faults and everything that had happened, everyone still respected him. Even Barrett held a grudging respect for him, though he'd likely never admit it. Reaching the center of Medil, Tifa came to a stop and looked around. Where should she begin? 
should she start with the shop owners, who stood outside their stores calling out to passers-by, encouraging them to look at their wares, weapons, and materia? Or should she go door to door, see if anyone knew anything about the live stream? As she was thinking of this, a small dog came loping up to her and rubbed its nose against her ankle. Tifa looked down at the dog. It looked up at her. What's the matter? Are you all alone? Tifa asked, kneeling down. She patted the dog's head and scratched it behind the ears. The dog came closer to her, whining for attention. You got lost, didn't you, said Tifa. Separated from someone you love? Silly thing. A large hand touched her shoulder. Tifa looked up. Barrett was standing behind her, his face filled with so much concern that Tifa felt her heart beat painfully. Glancing around, she saw the same look reflected in the faces in her other friends, even the seemingly unfeeling Vincent. Tifa felt immediately foolish. No, of they didn't think she was silly. They were worried for her. Turning back to Barrett, Tifa forced a confident smile onto her face. Guess it's been about a week now since he washed up here on the shore. Poor pokey-headed young thing. Tifa and Barrett started at the same time. The same thought flashed through their minds. Sharing a quick glance, they turned their eyes across the street, where two men were stood talking. It was really sad. But weird, said the other man. His companion stood in front of him, so Tifa could not see his face, but she could hear him clearly. He spread his arms wide. He was holding this really long sword. I dunno. This whole thing feels unlucky to me. But the amazing thing was those weird blue eyes. Weird blue eyes. Eyes that glowed due to an infusion with Mako energy. They belonged to a face framed by, as it had been so eloquently described, pokey blonde hair. And in the person's hand. A long, wide-bladed sword capable of cutting stone and concrete in two. The face of a man from an almost forgotten dream, walking into darkness. The image came to her so swiftly that Tifa jumped to her feet, startling the poor dog and causing Barrett to back away in alarm. Wah! W.H. Wait a minute. Tifa almost shrieked. What did you just say? Dodging Barrett's restraining arm and ignoring his warning mutter, Tifa darted across the street toward the two men. Made somewhat anxious by the sudden shout of this woman and the sight of her running determinately toward them, they wondered if they ought to run. One look into her face, seeing her set eyes, and a glance at her strong frame and studded gloves, made them think otherwise. Tifa stopped before them. Excuse me. She said. That young man you were just talking about. The two men looked at one another nervously. Finally, the first man spoke. Yeah. A villager found him a little ways down the coast. He explained, pointing to the east, away from the village. It was about a week ago, I think. The other man nodded in agreement. Yeah, poor kid. He must be drifted from pretty far away. From the other side of the world, thought Tifa, her heart racing wildly. Spinning on her heel, surprising the two men once more, she faced Barrett and her friends. Cloud. She said, unable to contain her excitement. It must be. It's Cloud. Heh, good job, Tifa, said Sid, giving her a thumbs up. Bingo. Yuffie cheered, throwing her fist into the air in triumph, though she had done little to aid the search other than hide in the high winds engine room and be sick. Her face beaming with joy, Tifa turned back to the two bewildered men behind her. So where is he? She asked them, her voice trembling. Is he safe? Where is he now? Her eyes scanned the street, half expecting to see Cloud walk out from one of the houses. Once again, the two men looked at each other. Strange, sorrowful looks crossed their faces as they finally realized that this woman had no idea. Finally one of the men turned and pointed to the large house at the end of the village. Yeah. Up ahead here. He said to her. At the, uh, clinic. Tifa looked over at the building. It stood out against the rest of the buildings in Medeal, for most of it was painted white. He's alive. She said, her dark eyes shining. Cloud. Cloud's alive. Cloud. Oh, hey. Wait up. The calls of her friends did not reach her. Tifa ran up the street toward the great, white house. 
A cloud of sand formed around her as she kicked up the dirt, clogging her nose and parching her throat, but she ignored all of these. Her eyes and her thoughts were focused on that one house. Here she would be reunited with Cloud, and everything would be all right. Cloud would be back, and they would carry on in their quest to destroy Shinra and Sephiroth. Nothing else mattered. All she had to do was reach him. The doorknob was in her hand, and then the door was open. Tifa burst into the clinic. Cloud! A tall man with graying hair and a long, white lab coat stood before her, gazing up at charts he had placed along the wall. Hearing the door open and the sound of Tifa's voice, the man started and spun around in alarm. A pair of thick-rimmed spectacles rested on the bridge of his nose, and he had the queerest mustache Tifa had ever seen before. She would have found it quite comical, if she had not had her mind on other things. Here now, said the man calmly. He appeared to be a doctor. The way you're running around here, you would think meteor fell or something. I'm sorry, Tifa replied. Even as she spoke, her eyes were sweeping the room eagerly. But I heard that a friend of mine was being taken care of here. A friend. The doctor folded his arms for a moment, thinking, and then nodded his head. Oh yeah. That young fellow? Don't worry. Your friend is next door. But I'm afraid his condition is. Here. Asked Tifa, looking over at the door that led into the next room. She nodded. Over here. Before the doctor could speak, she ran into the room. Cloud. The next room was apparently a ward of some kind. There were three hospital beds, each covered with clean, white linen sheets, all of them neatly made. A window on the far wall let in sunlight, which shone upon the beds and the floor. A nurse in a white uniform and dark hair tied back into a tight bun stood in front of a figure sat, seemingly in a chair. If the alarm bells of concern were ringing, Tifa was deaf to them, for she spotted, past the nurse's arm, a flash of spiky blonde hair. Her heart leaping to her throat, she darted forward, even as the others ran into the hospital. Oh! Cloud! She said. I'm so glad you're safe. Cloud! Tifa stopped. Her heart froze. Upon her entry into the ward, the nurse turned around and moved aside from her patient, allowing Tifa to see the person she had been attending. It was the sight that she saw that caused Tifa's heart to freeze and her throat to constrict. It was Cloud, of that there was no doubt. But he looked so terrible that for a moment Tifa thought that her mind and eyes must be playing some kind of horrible trick on her. It was not a chair that Cloud was sitting in, but a wheelchair. He was slumped heavily in it, his hands resting weakly on the armrests. When he breathed, there came a terrible wheezing, whistling sound, as though his lungs were unable to inflate properly. His skin was pale, almost deathly, and his face had a faint sheen of sweat to it. But it was his eyes that sent chills down Tifa's spine. As Cloud lifted his head from his chest and looked at her, she saw that his blue eyes were open wide, as though in terror. The pupils had dilated, and the irises glowed with such a fierce intensity that it was a wonder they did not burn from the glow. Though he was facing Tifa he did not see her but stared at her blankly, looking past her, through her even, as though she was not even there. Those terror-stricken eyes gazed around wildly as Cloud raised his shaking head. When he spoke, it was not words that passed through his lips, but a garbled mess of unintelligible symbols. Uh. Ah. Uh. He mumbled. Taking his eyes away from Tifa he lifted them to the ceiling, letting his head roll back against the wheelchair. He took a deep, whistling breath, letting it out shakily. Tifa, horrified at what she saw before her, took a careful step forward. W.H. What's wrong? Cloud. In response, Cloud lowered his head gaze to look past her again. Sweat trickled down his pale skin. His hands clenched and unclenched the armrests, his nails digging into the leather. Another whistling breath. A. Gurk. He said. Then, as though losing all strength, his head dropped back to his chest. Cloud. Said Tifa. What happened to you? Mako poisoning. Said the doctor, who was now standing in the open doorway. He looked over at Cloud, who was struggling once more to raise his head from his chest. Quite an advanced case. It appears this young man's been exposed to a high level of Mako energy for a protracted period of time. He probably has no idea where he is now. 
pausing, the doctor closed his eyes and shook his head. Poor fellow, his voice doesn't even work. He is literally miles away from us. Some place where no one's ever been. All alone. Doctor. Gasped Tifa, turning to glare at him. Damn. That's evil, said Sid, stood behind the doctor, shaking his head in pity. Next to him, Vincent slowly nodded his head. Tifa, shaken by the doctor's words, turned back to look at Cloud. The young man had managed to lift his head again and was staring up at the ceiling. Each time he exhaled came that awful whistling sound. The truth of the words began to sink in. He truly did not see her, or know that she was even there. Slowly she sank to her knees, fearing she may faint in her shock. The doctor, seeing her face go pale, coughed loudly. Ahem. Let us excuse ourselves. He said, as everyone turned to look at him. Listen, he added, would you all mind? Waiting outside. One by one, Sid, Vincent, and the others left the hospital. The doctor and the nurse, also, stepped outside. Only Barrett remained, taking a moment to look over at Tifa, who was kneeling silently in front of Cloud. He watched as Cloud's head dropped back to his chest, and the tips of his spiky blonde hair brushed against Tifa's own dark hair. He stayed for just a moment, however, before turning and leaving the room, closing the door behind him. When they were all gone, Tifa dropped her head. Long dark hair fell over her face, hiding the tears that were threatening to fall down her cheeks. Out of all the things she had expected to happen upon finding Cloud, this... This... Was not one of them. Why? What do you want me to do? She asked helplessly, though she expected no answer from the silent figure before her. She looked up, and through the lengths of dark hair that obscured her vision, saw a pair of wide, glowing eyes staring blankly back at her. Please, Cloud. She begged. She took his hand in hers. Talk to me. Tell me you can see me, that you can hear me. Tell me, please. She squeezed his hand. Her head dropped. I came this far believing in the memories we have together. She shook her head. This isn't happening. This is too cruel. Her body began to tremble. Oh, Cloud. I. Then, with only the sound of Cloud's wheezing, whistling breath for company, Tifa Lockhart began to cry. End of Chapter Episode 7, Part 10, Chapter 06 Chapter 6 Barrett shut the hospital door and sighed heavily, his thoughts on Tifa. He knew that by now she would be crying, alone in that room, with the one person who could make her smile again unable to help her. The thought angered him, and he clenched his fist tightly, wanting to slam it against the wooden door with all his might. Damn him for making her feel this way. He thought. Damn it all. Opening his eyes, he saw the others were on the street, gathered around the doctor and the young nurse. This was no time for him to lose his temper. There were things to be done, things to sort out. Barrett swallowed his anger as best he could before pushing himself away from the door, going to stand with the others. Red 13 looked up at the doctor. Tell me, doctor, is Cloud all right? He asked softly, his bright eyes looking at the elder man hopefully. I mean will he heal? I'll say it again, the doctor said patiently, he's got Mako poisoning. I've never seen a case this bad. An immense amount of Mako-drenched knowledge was put into his brain all at once. No normal human could have survived it. It's a miracle he did. No wonder muttered Barrett. After fallen in the life stream and being washed up here. And not being a normal human himself, he added silently. But remember, the light of hope can be found anywhere, said the doctor, looking around at each member of the group, taking in their grim, worn, tired faces. Listen. He said to them, his voice low, if you give up hope. He gestured to the hospital, what will happen to him? There was a moment's silence as everyone considered his words. Sid scratched his head thoughtfully, unsure of what the old man meant. Yuffie, her brain hurting from all this thinking, dropped down and drew in the dirt with the edge of her razor ring, wishing someone would decide already so they could get moving. 
Vincent closed his eyes, Cat twisted his feline head back and forth, troubled. Red 13, his head lowered, pawed at the ground with his claws for a moment, lost in deep thought. He closed his eyes. His claws extended, feeling the dirt scrape beneath them. Finally, he nodded and raised his head. Hmm, I know he'll recover. He announced confidently, as everyone's eyes turned to him. Cloud was a strong member of Soldier. At this, Barrett turned away and crossed his arms. Red 13 seemed very confident, and his words seemed to strike a chord with the rest of the party. But he, for some reason, just could not shake off a niggling doubt. Memories of the events in the Northern Cave flooded to his mind. Sephiroth. Shinra. Cloud giving Sephiroth the Black Materia. Hope. He mumbled quietly. Hey, but honestly, man. Do I really want him to come back? He asked himself. What did he do for the world? What can he do for us from here on out? He may be nothing more than Sephiroth's shadow. Is something wrong? Asked the doctor, looking at him. The others were looking at him, as well. Barrett turned back. No, nothing. Nothing at all, Doc. The door then opened, and Tifa stepped out. Everyone turned. Tifa's face was pale and drawn, and if she had been crying it didn't show, for her face was still damp from when she had washed it before coming out. Seeing the multitude of worried faces looking at her, she tried to force a brave smile onto her face. She would have succeeded, if it weren't for her eyes showing a different story. You okay? Barrett asked her. Tifa looked over at him, her dark eyes saddened. Yes. She answered simply. Then she turned her eyes toward everyone. I'm sorry I had you all worried. She apologized. And I have something I want to tell you all. Tifa turned and walked back inside the hospital. Barrett and all the others followed her, until they were all gathered once more in the ward where Cloud still sat, slumped, in the wheelchair. Tifa had opened the window in their absence, and a cool draft now blew throughout the room. The fighter stood beside Cloud, facing her friends with a sad, though determined, expression on her face. I don't care about anything else, she told them, only Cloud. I... I want to be by his side. No looks of surprise crossed the faces of her friends. If they were honest, they had suspected this ever since they saw the state Cloud was in. They knew that Tifa could never willingly walk away and leave her friend like this. You gotta do it then, Yuffie told her. You gotta live true to yourself. Yeah, that's probably best. Barrett agreed. For Cloud. And for you. One by one the others nodded their agreement and approval. Touched by their sentiment, Tifa lowered her eyes to the floor. I'm sorry, everyone. At a time like this. Lifting her eyes, she looked at everyone. No big, no big, said Yuffie, forcing a smile and hefting her razor ring up onto her shoulder, its razor-sharp blade glinting in the sunlight streaming in from the open window. I'll pop in again later. You take care now, Tifa, Barrett said, somewhat sternly. And take care of Cloud. Tifa glanced over her shoulder. Cloud had managed to lift his head from his chest and was resting it against the back of the wheelchair. He had tilted his head to one side and was staring out the window, where the sky was tinged slightly red from Meteor's presence. The light touching his pale face, therefore, was also tinged red, giving him a fevered complexion. His mouth opened and closed wordlessly. Tifa turned back. Right? She said. Barrett then turned away, intending to leave the hospital and head back to the airship. But he hesitated. The question he had been dying to ask Tifa ever since Janon burned on his tongue. He couldn't leave without knowing the answer to that question. Or, at least, hear Tifa's answer. Oh, Anna, uh, Tifa. He began hesitantly, tilting his head slightly. I don't like a skin this but... Is he really your childhood friend? And not Sephiroth's shadow? Hey. Tifa seemed startled by the question. Well. That is. Once more, she glanced over her shoulder. When she looked back, her face was determined. She shook her head. No, I'm sure of it. 
Yeah. Said Barrett, turning to meet her gaze. He looked deep into her eyes, trying to see if she was telling the truth. There was no deception in her eyes she truly believed what she said. Barrett sighed. Okay then. Sorry for asking that. The two continued to stare at each other awkwardly, as neither could think of anything more to say to comfort or reassure the other. As they looked at each other, Yuffie leaned over and nudged Cat in his furry ribs. Hey, shouldn't we be getting back to the high wind? Within the hour, the party arrived back at the high wind, one down now that they had to leave Tifa behind in Medial. The doctor had said it would be no problem if Tifa stayed in fact, it would be good for the patient to have a familiar face around, and left him and the nurse free to take care of other pressing matters. Once on the high wind, the pilots, now much more confident in their flying ability, took the ship to the air and sped off across the shores of Medial, following the island's coast until they were given their next destination. The high wind flew low along the coast, the air stream from the engines scheming the calm ocean surface and creating a stream of white spray behind them. The mood on deck, however, was far from calm. What are we gonna do now? shouted Barrett angrily, half deafening those unlucky enough to be in close proximity. What can we do? he demanded, spinning around to face the others and looking at them expectantly. Hey! Ain't there nothing that we can do? And don't go telling us to wait for Cloud to get better! He warned, shaking his gun arm menacingly. Around him, the others were silent. Vincent shrugged, Red 13's tail moved uneasily across the deck, and he shook his main head regretfully. Yuffie, upon her return to the airship, had taken up her usual residence away from the deck, pale and sickly. Cat stayed at the back of the group, his back to the group, still and seemingly preoccupied. Sid, worn out from the long walk back to the airship, had sat down next to the piloting controls to catch his breath but had, at some point, ended up drifting off into a light sleep. This was where he lay even now, snoring softly, oblivious to Barrett's angry rants and raves. Barrett, looking around at his silent companions, felt himself grow angrier at this lack of activity. He needed to do something. They had wasted enough time already, flying back and forth across the continent in search of Cloud, and then when they did find him, he was in no state to help them out. What were Shinra up to, that's what he wanted to know. They could be plotting anything, and they were here, in a backwater part of the world, wasting time. Suddenly, Cat seemed to come back to life at that point, as he suddenly stood up, turned his robotic mog around, and moved it forward to rejoin the group. Oh, I've got some news, he announced cheerfully. Barrett narrowed his eyes. Yeah, what? That you a spy? He sneered. Cat came to a stop and fixed his feline face on Barrett. Yeah. I already told you I was. Sitting himself more comfortably on the mog's head, he winked at Barrett. Both Kihaha and Kiahaha are up to something. Wanna eavesdrop? A number of miles away from where the high wind schemed the ocean shores of Medial, an emergency meeting was being held in Shinra headquarters in Midgar. Rufus stood at the head of the meeting, his face grave as he thought long and hard about the problems that faced him and his company. Before him, his highest level employees looked just as nervous. Palmer, head of the space program, sat fidgeting in his seat, his pudgy face creased in growing anxiety. Over to one side, Reeve Tusty, head of urban development, was lost in thought, his fingers playing absently with the sleeve of his white shirt. Only Heidegger looked nonchalant, seemingly unaffected by his fellow employee's nervousness. He sat beside Palmer, tapping his fingers impatiently against the table, waiting for the president to begin. Rufus checked his watch. It was time to begin. Now then. He began, coming to stand before his employees, who looked up at him as he spoke. We're faced with two issues. One, destroy Meteor. Two, remove the barrier around the North Cave and defeat Sephiroth. The president looked around. Any ideas? Heidegger laughed his gya, ha, ha laugh, the one that earned him the not-so-affectionate nickname of gya, ha, ha from Katshi. We already solved the first problem. Heidegger boasted, his black beard bristling with confidence. Meteor will soon be smashed to bits. The plan has already been put into motion. Namely, to collect the huge materia from each region. He sat back, large arms crossed across his belly, grinning widely. Rufus stared at him blankly. Well. He began. The door behind him opened and Scarlet strolled casually in, not seeming to be aware that she was late for this important meeting. Though she had tried to hide the marks with makeup, 
the evidence of her slap fight with the escaped Tifa Lockhart was still visible on her face, though none dared to mention it. Passing the Shinra president, she began to explain to him the basics of hers and Heidegger's plans. Huge materia is a high-density special type of materia made by a special compression process in Mako reactors, she said, stopping at the edge of the table. The energy extracted from it is 330 times the strength of normal materia. Ha, ha, ha. How about that? She asked, spreading her hands. We will gather all the huge materia together and ram it into meteor. That will cause a huge explosion. Reducing meteor literally to bits. Rufus's eyes opened wide. You're going to ram Meteor? He asked skeptically. He ran the idea over in his mind. Thinking it over, he looked up at Scarlet. Do you think we have the technology to do it? Don't worry about that. Scarlet assured him. More importantly, we've got to collect huge materia from each area. We've already collected materia from Nibelheim, Heidegger added. All that's left is Corel and Fort Condor. I've already dispatched troops to Corel. He laughed loudly. Corel! shouted Barrett as Cat cut off the connection between the airship and Shinra HQ. Spinning around, he shook his fists angrily. What else can they do to Corel? And the huge materia? Red 13 tilted his head to look up at Cat, who sat with his legs dangling on the mog. You mean the huge materia, don't you? I've heard about it. When our small materia nears the larger one, something should happen. I'm certain of it. That's why we're using the power of materia in our fight. Barrett cursed under his breath. Can't let Shinra get a hold of the huge materia. He said through gritted teeth. Besides, when Cloud gets back, I want to show him this huge materia. He's gonna be shocked. Cat raised an eyebrow and leaned forward, resting his chin on the rim of his megaphone. So, what are you saying, Barrett? The cat asked him curiously, with a hint of sarcasm in his voice. Even though you're always knocking him, you really want Cloud to return. For a few moments Barrett said nothing. Firstly, he glared at Kat Shi with an expression of impotent fury upon his dark face. Then, half spluttering with rage, he turned away and kept his back to them. Finally, he spun back to face the cat, eyes narrowed in sheer anger. I ain't saying nothing bout nothing. He snapped. You just... Shut your face. Ignoring the smug look on the cat's face, Barrett turned to face Vincent and Red 13, his gun arm shaking in anger. Every group's gotta have a leader. And that's me. He shook his gun arm a moment more, and then looked at it silently. Or at least I wanna be. He added, letting the arm fall to his side. But I ain't cut out to be no leader. I never knew that till lately. The big man sighed heavily. And that's what is. There came a deep snore, followed by a snort and a cough. All eyes turned toward Sid, who was just waking up. The ex-Shinra pilot opened his eyes sleepily, peering out in confusion at his blurred surroundings. He rubbed his eyes with his leather gloves, trying to clear the sleep from them. Humph! He muttered, looking around. He blinked again, this time more clearly, and saw a pair of gold-plated, pointed shoes surrounded by a frayed red cape, and the feet of a large, red hound nearby. Raising his eyes, he saw the faces of Vincent and Red 13, owners of the said pointed shoes and large feet, looking down at him with expressions of mild amusement, as much as amusement could be discerned from the face of Red 13. Shaking his head, Sid clambered to his feet. Wah! He asked, confused. What's going on? Barrett pointed at him. You've been chosen to be the new leader, he declared. Sid stared at him in disbelief, then scowled and spat on the floor. Pain in the ass! Forget it. Barrett half expected this protest. The pilot was caught up in their troubles by chance, because it was a choice of either join them and fight against the Shinra, or go back to a town of broken dreams and bitter memories. That didn't mean that Sid wanted to take a prominent role in the Shinra's downfall. But though Barrett was not, by his own admission, cut out to be a leader, he was still cunning enough to know how to manipulate this middle-aged pilot into taking the role. But for us to fight, we gotta have the high wind, and you, the big man said placidly, almost casually, as though what he was saying was common knowledge. We need to save the planet. And who's running this ship? You. That's why you're our new leader. Ain't no one else can. Sid mulled this over in his mind, thinking hard. Hmm. This ship's gonna save the planet, hey? He repeated, rubbing his stubble chin thoughtfully. He looked at Barrett suspiciously. 
Ain't that gonna be a little tough? He tapped his head, a habit he had developed when he was thinking. Finally, the lines of suspicion smoothed from his face and he raised his face, a wide grin on his face. Oh man, that went straight to my heart. I'm a man, too. Okay, I'll do it. Everyone, follow me. Satisfied, Barrett nodded. That was one problem sorted, at least. All right, now here's the first job, he said. The operation room's waiting for you. Yeah. Sid replied, jumping up from where he was and running across the bridge toward the lower decks, leaving the bewildered and amused party and airship crew behind. He almost leaped down the stairs leading to the bridge, where Yuffie was stood keeling over, still feeling nauseous. Sid was just running across the bridge when Barrett's voice boomed down after him. Yo, Sid. When you're ready, we're heading for the Corel reactor. Come on, Mr. Leader, you would better hurry. Hearing this, Yuffie slowly lifted her head. Sid. She asked miserably, looking at Sid as he charged past her at high speed toward the operation room. She didn't bother to ask why Sid had been called leader, instead just shrugging her shoulders and returning to her sickly vigil. Sid, meanwhile, went to the operation room to consult the map on the large wall. He didn't really know what he was looking for, but it made him feel important to consult it. It was something a leader ought to do check the map to make sure of their destination. He placed a pin over the spot marked North Corel and nodded in satisfaction. With the airship, they would get there in a matter of hours, less if they really pushed the engines into it. Feeling his job here was done, he headed back toward the bridge. Katshi was talking to himself as Sid walked on deck. Hmm, the huge materia is at Corel, Fort Condor. He lifted his crown and scratched his furry head. I'm sure there was another place that had it. Where was that? Seeing Sid walking back onto the bridge, Barrett turned and waved sharply. Yo, Mr. Leader. Get your pilot ass up here. Ignoring Barrett, Sid took his time strolling up onto the main deck, coming to stand beside the airship's pilot. The young apprentice he had been schooling since leaving Junon now stood confidently by the controls, guiding the ship with ease over the ocean waters. All trace of nervousness was gone from the young man's face, and he looked at Sid with pride and excitement. Yeah. Shall we take off? He asked eagerly. Sid nodded. Yes. The pilot grinned. Yeah. We're taking off. Pulling on the joystick, the airship made a sharp lift upward, rising away from the ocean shore and up into the blue skies. After receiving directions from Sid, the airship then turned steadily around and began to fly at high speed toward the west, heading for the western continent and the town of North Corel. End of Part 10 Part 11, The Hunt for the Huge Materia End of Chapter Episode 8, Part 11, Chapter 07 Part 11, The Hunt for the Huge Materia Chapter 7 The high wind wasted no time flying across the ocean to the western continent. The airship's crew, empowered by Sid's rather colorful motivation speeches, gave all they had to power the airship through the reddening skies. It took the high wind just over an hour to cross the ocean and the western shores became visible on the horizon. The gold saucer was the first thing they saw, its bright lights visible even in daylight miles away from the shore. There had been many disputes during the trip over how they should enter the mountains and penetrate the Mako reactor. Barrett, on edge, said they should land outside North Corel and cross the train tracks. Red 13 suggested that they fly over the mountains and land in the Costa Plains west of Costa del Sol, entering the mountains as they had done before. The decision eventually fell to Sid, after the former avalanche leader and the hound argued vehemently over which was the best route. Barrett's suggestion saved them a little time, though the old rail tracks were rickety and beyond repair. Red 13S meant they had to fly around the mountains, but meant they were closer to the reactor at the end. Sid, enveloped in his new role as leader, made a big show of listing the pros and cons of each suggestion, much to Barrett's annoyance, before finally coming to a decision. The high wind landed in the deep valley of the Corel Plains just outside of North Corel. There was a big commotion going on in North Corel as the party entered. Everyone living in the village had left their homes and shops and had gathered in the northern end of the village, looking down the rail tracks leading out of the village and into the vast mountains of Corel. The people murmured in hushed voices, their faces troubled and nervous. They did not pay any attention to Sid and his crew, so focused were they on the railroad. After a nod from Sid, 
Vincent slipped up beside one of the villagers. What is going on? He asked quietly. The man did not take his eyes off the railroad. Shinra soldiers came around saying they were gathering up all the huge materia. I think they're gonna bring it here by coal train, from the Corel reactor. Vincent left him and relayed the information to the others. Sid crossed his arms and tapped his foot. Well, we know they're here, then, he said. Guess we have no choice but to go up to the reactor and stop them from excavating this huge materia. GRRGH. Then let's get moving already. Said Barrett, his eyes wild. We're wasting time. Before anyone could stop him, Barrett began to push his way roughly through the crowd. The villagers of Corel shouted in protest as they were shoved rudely aside, many uttering curses as they recognized him. Barrett did not listen, nor did he stop or wait for the others when he reached the train tracks, but simply carried on, following the tracks into the mountains. Knowing that they could do nothing else, the others followed. It took them a while to catch up with Barrett, who didn't stop or slow his pace even when crossing the rail tracks. The old wooden rails, which rose at times about 50 feet above the mountain floor, creaked as the big man thudded his way across them, but did not bend or break beneath his weight. The expression on Barrett's face as he ran was firm and lethal. Even the monsters, the birds, and bombs alike, stayed well out of his way. Barrett finally stopped on a stretch of track leading up to the reactor. He peered around a wall of rock that lined the railroad and assessed the situation. Only two Shinra soldiers stood guard outside the entrance, both with standard Shinra issue machine guns. Clearly Shinra did not expect any trouble getting the huge materia out of Corel. Humph, thought Barrett. They should have learned by now. Pulling back behind the wall, Barrett checked his equipment. His gun arm was loaded and ready, and the gun arm's accessory, the chainsaw, still worked perfectly. His materia was secure. The summoned materia, Ifrit, glowed faintly, reacting to Barrett's anger and rage. Barrett looked down at it, contemplating. No, he would not use the summon here, but by God if they did anything to harm the people of Corel. The others caught up to him at this point. Yuffie, Sid, and Red Thirteen were all panting with exertion. Cat Shi sat astride Red Thirteen's back, his furry face grinning cheerfully. The robotic cat had chosen to leave his mock body back at the airship, saying it would be too clunky and heavy for this mission. Typically, Vincent showed no signs of fatigue, a fact that would have irked Barrett had he been of a mind to think about it. But there were more important matters at hand, like those Shinra soldiers. Are we ready? He asked the others once it looked like they had caught their breath mostly. One by one the others nodded, and drew their weapons. Yuffie's razor ring shuriken's sharpened blades caught the sunlight as she twirled it in the air, before securing the weapon in her gloved fist. The butt of Sid's spear rang with a metallic echo as he slammed it against the rocky floor, and he placed his cigarette firmly behind his ear. Red Thirteen bared his fangs, and on his back Cat she adjusted his crown and smoothed his whiskers. Vincent calmly drew his short-barreled gun and began to place bullets in the chamber. Looking at his comrades, a peculiar feeling came over Barrett. They seemed... incomplete. There were but six of them, not the party of nine they had been barely a month ago. Eris was no longer with them, after being killed by Sephiroth and now resting in peace in the lake of the Forgotten City. Tifa had remained in Medeal to take care of Cloud. Cloud. Now there was someone Barrett had never expected to miss. Barrett could not explain how, but the group seemed somewhat empty without him around. Every time Barrett turned he expected to see the spiky-headed young man standing there, with a smirk and that cocky stance of his. Even now, when Barrett turned to face the reactor, he expected to see Cloud standing ahead of them all, Buster sword in hand, and saying something really, really silly, like let's mosey. A smile crossed Barrett's face. He turned to the others once more. All right, then. He said, grinning widely. Let's get M. That was all the others needed to hear. Together they emerged from their hiding place and made a dash for the reactor. The two soldiers at the entrance, startled by the sight of six well-armed fighters heading their way, almost dropped their guns in their surprise. One took a step forward, his eyes widening behind his visor. You guys are... That was all the soldier managed to say before the razor ring struck his helmet, delivering a sounding blow that knocked the soldier off his feet and sent his gun skittering across the ground. The second soldier, seeing his comrade slump to the ground, raised his gun. He did not even manage to raise it past his waist before a bullet pierced his shoulder, causing him to cry out and release the gun. He barely had time to look up before he saw the dark, glowering shadow of Barrett fall over him. A fist connected with his helmet, and the soldier joined his comrade on the ground. 
quickly Red 13 and Vincent set about removing the unconscious forms of the Shinra soldiers from view. They each took one of the slumbering men, Red 13 grabbing the man's collar with his teeth, and dragged them around the side of the reactor. When that was done, Sid placed his hands on his hips and surveyed the situation. That small conflict did not seem to have attracted any extra attention from Shinra. No more soldiers appeared from inside the reactor. It really did seem like they had placed only two soldiers on guard. He exhaled deeply. Guess we're safe for now. Even as he spoke the silence was shattered by the sudden, deafening blare of a horn. Sid and the others froze on the spot, their eyes darting warily. Red 13 raised his head and sniffed the air. Through the foul-smelling, metallic haze that always surrounded Mako reactors, came a stronger, more intense scent that Red 13 could not identify. He took a few steps toward the large open doors of the reactor and sniffed again. The scent was coming from inside the reactor, along with a chug-chug sound. The ground began to tremble beneath his feet, as though something large and heavy was moving across the ground. He peered into the darkness. Suddenly, his ears flattened against his head and he backed up a few steps. Ah! Puzzled by the hound's sudden display of fright, Barrett went over to look. He also backed up a pace, and if he had been physically able to do it, his ears would have flattened as well. Damn He exclaimed. The horn they had heard had come from a coal train, and it was this train that was now speeding toward them from inside the reactor. Even as they realized this the train was already reaching the exit, and it was all they could do to scramble out of the way and avoid being run over. It was such a close call they could feel the air rushing past them, throwing dirt into their eyes and making them cough. The train continued on past them, speeding across the tracks and into the mountains. Once the train had passed, they climbed back onto their feet and looked down the tracks where it had gone. Looks like they're taken off with the huge materia in that train, said Sid. No, Barrett roared, running forward, his fists trembling. You dumb boneheads! Did the Shinra beat us? Asked Red 13, his head low. Hearing the downbeat tone in Red 13's voice, Sid walked to the front of the group and turned to face them all. His eyes were fierce. Hey, do you know who I am? He demanded tersely. I'm CID that's who the hell I am. Now just let me handle it. Shifting his spear to his other hand, Sid had a quick look around him. They needed to catch up to that train before it reached North Corel and Shinra escaped with the huge materia. The only way they could catch up to that train now was with something equally fast, like the airship, a car, or... Or another train. Sid ran toward the reactor. The giant metal doors had remained open after the train passed through, and the interior was dark and empty. There were no Shinra soldiers around the reactor was completely deserted. At Sid's feet were two sets of rail tracks, both of them leading into the reactor. Two tracks meant two trains. A sly smile spread on Sid's face, and he ran into the reactor. Barrett and the others looked at one another, puzzled as to what Sid had in mind. A moment later Sid called out to them, and they ran into the reactor after him. Around the side of the reactor, one of the two Shinra soldiers stirred and slowly sat up. His head was thudding painfully, and he carefully unclipped the helmet and tugged it off his head. He moaned he was going to have a terrible headache for a good while, he knew. After checking his comrade, who remained unconscious on the ground, the Shinra soldier stood up. He almost fainted, his knees just about held their ground. With the back of his hand he wiped away a trickle of blood from his forehead and staggered around to the front of the reactor. There was no sign of the wanted criminals. He had recognized them instantly their faces had been burned into the minds of every Shinra soldier. Had they been caught? The soldier stopped suddenly as the ground beneath his feet began to rumble. He looked down. Pebbles were beginning to dance along the ground, and a distant rumble like the roll of thunder could be heard inside the reactor. The Shinra soldier took a step closer toward the large doors as the rumbling grew louder. He barely pulled back in time when the train burst out of the doors and knocked him to the ground. The soldier shielded his face with his hands as dust and dirt flew around him, blown up by the whirring wheels of the train. Blinded by the dust, he could see nothing. But he could hear perfectly well, and over the chug-chug-chug of the train he could hear a distinct, accented, smug-sounding voice. Hey, 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 hey. End of Chapter Episode 9, Part 11, Chapter 08 Chapter 8 Hey, 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 hey.
it had been an immense stroke of luck that there was another coal train inside the Corel reactor. It was unmanned and unguarded, and still in good working order despite not being used for a number of years, when Corel abandoned its coal production and took up excavating Mako instead. Sid had now claimed ownership of the train, and now that train sped down the tracks in chase of the Shinra. Sid Highwind stood at the controls, his face radiating the kind of righteous smugness that only those who knew they had a good idea can radiate. Gathered in the control car around him were Barrett and the others. Red 13, with Cat Shi still on his back, acted as lookout on top of the car, his keen eyes peeled for any sign of the Shinra train. His face still smug, Sid turned to face the others, awaiting their praise. I'm impressed, said Vincent, much to Sid's delight. You can drive this, too. The smile never left Sid's face. Don't ask me. I don't know. He admitted. Vincent's red eyes widened in alarm. Wah! What? What? You serious? Demanded Jeffy. The others shared her sense of alarm Kate Sith could be heard muttering and whimpering from overhead. Sid, on the other hand, did not seem in the least bit concerned. He dismissed their agitated faces with a casual wave and turned to face the controls, studying them meticulously. Don't worry. He assured them, still smiling. I can handle this kind of stuff. Two levers, one on the right and one on the left. He took hold of the two levers, grasping them firmly in his hands. The train was mostly self-powered, running on coal that burned hotly in the furnace at the back of the car. There appeared to be no other controls apart from these levers, which Sid assumed to be used for changing the speed of the train. He pulled the left lever back and pushed the right lever forward. He then reversed the process, pulling the right lever back while the left went forward. At this movement, the train gave a small shudder, and Sid got the impression that it had sped up a notch. I see, he muttered, mostly to himself, just alternate the two levers up and down, right? Judging from the enemy's speed, I'd say it'll take about ten minutes. He glanced back at the others and grinned. We're gonna fly. Hold on tight. Sid's estimations were a little short of the mark. It did not take them ten minutes to catch up to the Shinra train in fact, it barely took them five minutes. This was nothing to do with Sid, who powered the levers back and forth with all the might he could muster. No, it was because the Shinra train had slowed down. While the tracks on the ground were still fairly secure, those tracks that crossed the 50-foot chasm in the middle of the mountains were, in many places, in disrepair. With their valuable cargo on board, they could not risk their train dropping off into the chasm, and so they were forced to slow down. Sid, however, was not so concerned about the state of the tracks. He was a knowledgeable pilot and knew a great deal about how things were built and structured. He estimated that the rail tracks could hold a speeding train, and to prove his point, and ignoring the desperate pleas of Barrett and the others for him to slow down, he charged the train across the tracks. Out of everything the companions had faced over the weeks and months they had traveled together facing Sephiroth, the emergence of weapon, the appearance of meteor in the sky this single event probably ranked as the most frightening thing any of them had ever faced. Each one of them, in those terrifying moments where the coal train rumbled and trembled and wobbled over the rickety tracks, made a solemn, soul-binding pledge. Never would they appoint Sid as leader again. Whatever luck was on their side continued to hold, for after what seemed like an eternity, but was actually less than a minute, the train reached the other side of the chasm and was back on the solid ground. Had Sid glanced around at this point, he would have found four pairs of eyes glaring at him, it would have been five pairs, but Yuffie was indisposed at the side of the train bringing up the contents of her lunch. There was no time for arguments and threats at this point, for now the Shinra train was just ahead of them, and they were gaining fast. Cat Shi slid off Red 13's back and jumped down into the car. We're right behind them, the cat informed them. It'd be best if we jumped from this train onto theirs from the back, and make our way up to the front. Why not just ride up to the cabin and jump straight in and stop the train? Asked Sid, grunting with the effort of shifting the levers back and forth. Cat Shi shook his head. There are Shinra soldiers on this train, he said. If we try to come up alongside them, they will shoot at us as we pass, and we'll all be dead before we can even reach the cabin. If we come up behind and jump onto their train from there, we can work our way along. The soldiers can't risk shooting at us without causing damage to the train or the huge materia. You had better make up your minds, called Red 13 from above. The hound was shifting restlessly. We've almost caught up to them. Cat ran to the side of the car and hopped up onto a crate of coal by the window. The wind from outside ruffled his fur. Trust me on this, he insisted. 
Sid glanced at the window, where the back end of the Shinra train was coming into view. His arms were burning. He doubted he could keep powering the train long enough to reach the cabin anyway. No doubt the Shinra knew they were being chased and would speed up any second now. Sweat trickled down his face. Finally, he nodded. Go. Oh. He ordered. Everyone climbed up to join Red 13 on the top of the car, all except for Sid, who remained in the control room. He thrust the levers with all his strength, urging the train along, until their car was directly alongside the rear car of the Shinra train. Red 13 made the jump first, leaping across the gap between the two trains. The rear car of the Shinra train was filled with coal, and as he landed the black lumps skittered and slid. Red 13 staggered, his black claws digging through the coal, trying to find a foothold. The fact that the car was moving made this difficult, so he scurried along with his belly, scraping the floor to the edge of the car to give the others room to jump. Yuffie came next, overcoming her motion sickness just long enough to make the jump. Her agile body made the jump seem effortless, and she landed without toppling, joining Red 13. Katshi clung to Barrett's large frame as he jumped the gap. His heavy boots sank an inch into the coal, covering them with black soot. Vincent remained perched on the edge of the car. He raised his head and looked down the Shinra car. Their approach had been noticed there were soldiers massing near the front of the train. He turned to Sid. Sid, hurry! He urged him. The pilot needed no prompting. After a few more arm-breaking thrusts on the levers, he let them go and began to scramble up onto the roof of the car. Vincent aided him by grabbing his arm and pulling the pilot up onto the roof. Now that the levers were unmanned, the train was steadily beginning to slow down. Quickly, the two men leaped from the car, landing on the opposite train as there slipped behind them. Quickly! Barrett shouted over the roar of the train. We can't be far from Corel. Make your way to the front of the train. No one needed prompting. They were already moving, drawing their weapons and climbing over the edge of the car. The next car, and the ones that followed it, were all covered in heavy, opaque netting. There was something under this netting the surface was bumpy and there were sharp bits poking up from underneath. There was little time to wonder what was beneath the netting, however, for their troubles lay ahead of them, not underneath. A small number of Shinra soldiers, only four in total, had assembled in the car behind the control car. Three of the soldiers took up positions on top of the car and raised their rifles, aiming at the advancing intruders. The fourth stood just behind them, apparently fumbling with some sort of control panel. Red 13 and Yuffie had just climbed into the next car when the three soldiers opened fire. A hail of bullets whizzed through the air and thudded against the car. Yuffie and Red 13 threw themselves to the floor, hugging the net and feeling the whoosh of bullets zipping over their heads. Barrett and the others, still in the rear car, also dropped to the ground. While the bullets rained overhead, Vincent calmly unscrewed the short barrel of his gun and replaced it with a longer barrel, designed to shoot targets from further away. After snapping it into place, he rolled onto his front and peered over the edge of the car. Yuffie! Red 13! Stay down! He called, and then opened fire. Vincent was an excellent marksman, and even shooting while on a fast-moving train could not alter his aim. He took down the first two soldiers with ease, shooting them in the legs so that they buckled and, consequently, slipped off the side of the train. The third shot missed as the train rounded a bend, but the next shot hit its mark, and the soldier fell off the train with a cry. The fourth soldier finally completed what he was doing. He gave a triumphant yell as he raised the control panel up and slammed his fist down hard on a large green button. His triumph ended there as a fourth and final bullet struck him in the chest. The soldier slumped silently out of sight. The group rose to their feet, believing the path to the cabin was now clear. They were badly mistaken. It was not just the huge materia the Shinra were escorting from the Corel reactor. Also on the train, hidden by the heavy netting, were some of the weapons development department's new weapons. It was one of these new weapons that the soldier had activated just before Vincent shot him down. It was one of these weapons that was now straining against its trappings in order to break free. The pegs holding the net in place broke away with a loud ping, and the net was blown away by the rushing wind. The weapon emerged from its holdings and into the light. It was known by Shinra as the Eagle Gun, a name that was quite fitting considering its design. It was built in the shape of a giant eagle, made out of the strongest metals that Shinra could find. Its body was totally covered in this metal casing, leaving it almost impregnable. In flight it was more than two meters from wingtip to wingtip, perhaps even three. The wingtips were designed to spread out and forward, ending in powerful gun barrels. The Eagle Gun could fire bullets from either one or both of its giant wings, and the barrels could shift positions at will, aiming at more than one target at once. 
The bullets were made from a condensed form of Mako energy, though they were not anywhere near condensed enough to be considered materia bullets. The weapon's heart was a concentrated source of Mako energy, located in the middle of its back where the wings joined onto the body. Standing in the gushing wind, the group stared. Ah! So that's what Scarlet's been working on? muttered Cat under his breath. The eagle gun stretched its giant wings and hopped up onto the edge of the car. The entire train shuddered at its movement. Raising its head, it screeched. The sound was piercing and hurt their ears, they had to clamp their hands over them to blot out the awful sound. The eagle gun then flapped its wings and rose from the train and up into the air. It rose high and circled the train. Sid cursed. We don't have time for this. He shouted, looking up at the giant metal bird circling above them. This train could reach Corel any minute. Get moving, people. On his orders, the group began to move forward down the train. Their eyes continued to stray constantly up toward the sky, where the eagle gun was circling high above them. Cat, said the pilot as he scrabbled over the netting in the next car, what is that thing? Cat shook his head. I don't know, the cat answered truthfully. This is a new design. I haven't seen. Heads up! roared Barrett, rising to his feet. The eagle gun had finished circling and was now descending in a swift dive. It screeched again and twisted its winged gun barrels forward. Its metallic eyes glowed red, and then it let loose a stream of Mako bullets. Bullets zipped and pinged off the cars of the train, sparking with electric light. The group on the cars shielded themselves as best they could from the fire, but it was only mere luck that none of them were hit directly. A moving train was a hard target to hit, but more than one of those Mako bullets landed uncomfortably close. Seconds after the shadow of the bird fell over them as it passed by overhead. Barrett rose to his feet and fired back at the bird. The bullets struck the bird on its metal frame, but did nothing other than bounce off the surface. Barrett stopped and stared, then his face twisted in rage and he let off another stream of bullets, as though sheer willpower alone would make them hit. Cat Shi shook his head again. It's no use. That metal is reinforced with Mako. It's almost impregnable. Almost said Vincent softly. That's right. Cat turned and looked up at him. The major flaw with the recent designs of the weapons development department is that they all use a vast supply of Mako as well as money. Scarlet spends huge amounts creating this impenetrable armor, so much in fact that she has little left to defend the other, more vital parts of the weapon. That is the key to defeating her weapons, if you get my meaning. I see. Said Vincent. Well, I don't. Yuffie grumbled inside the next car. What are you two on about? Lass, you have no imagination. Cat admonished, smirking as Yuffie popped her head up from over the edge of the car and scowled at him menacingly. He waved a finger at her. It's simple biology, Yuffie. Think about it. What is the most vital part of the human body? The ninja screwed her face up in thought, and then she grinned. The brain. She said triumphantly. Well, yes, the brain, admitted Cat. But also, the heart. Scarlet places her power source in the heart of the weapon, much like a regular monster. This is where all the power comes from, and is also the place where the armor is at its weakest. Aim for the heart, and you defeat the monster. Or weapon. I see. Vincent turned to look down the train. Time was ticking by. It would no doubt be a matter of minutes before the train reached the outer limits of Corel. Turning the other way, he looked up at the eagle gun. It was beginning to swerve in the sky, preparing for another dive. The problem with this weapon was the armor. The armor would deflect regular bullets, and Vincent had no doubt that the armor was also resistant to most magics, making their ice and fire materia practically useless. It was also a moving target, so getting a direct hit to the heart of the machine would be a difficult one. If only they could make it slow down or stop for a brief moment, then he could. Sid, said Vincent, shifting across the coals to join the pilot, who was watching the bird fly through the skies. The pilot nodded his acknowledgement. Tell me. Vincent asked him softly, do you still have the gravity materia? The pilot looked at him, baffled. Then he checked his equipment. There was but one materia slot on his spear, located just beneath the head. And it was, as Vincent had hoped, the gravity materia. It's here, Sid replied. Why? Vincent quickly relayed his plan. Humph, it might just work, Sid conceded as he handed over his spear. 
I'll leave Red 13 with you, too, just in case. Hearing his name, Red 13 hopped back into the car and joined Vincent. Vincent nodded in agreement. Sid gave him a pat on the shoulder, then stood up and faced his friends. All right, people. He shouted over the roar of the wind. I want you sissies to come with me. We're gonna make a run for the front of the train. Get a move on, people. Once again, on his command, Yuffie, Barrett, and Kat Shee jumped up and began to dash to the front of the train. Yuffie, tired of scrabbling like a thief over the bumpy netting, leapt up onto the metal rim of the car and ran along that, her nimble body moving swiftly and with practiced ease. Barrett eyed her jealously, knowing that if he tried that he would tumble and fall over the edge of the train. A single loud screech was all that heralded the Eagle Gun's attack. The screech was immediately followed by the loud ping-ping of bullets as they hit the rocky ground behind the train, gaining in volume as they drew nearer. Yuffie shrieked and covered her head, expecting at any moment to be shredded to pieces by gunfire. Thankfully this fate was not to pass, for Red 13 and Vincent were already in position and ready to attack. Wielding Sid's spear in his metal-gloved hand, Vincent activated the gravity materia and hurled the weapon into the air just as the eagle gun flew within range. He held his breath. If the spear did not hit its mark, then he and Red 13 would be cut to ribbons before they could even turn to run. The spear soared through the air, its tip shrouded in purple light emanating from the glowing materia. The spear struck its target, lodging as hoped in one of the ridges between the metal plates of the eagle gun's left wing. Upon contact the gravity materia glowed brighter, and the purple light began to spread until the eagle gun's left side became enclosed in it. The air surrounding the eagle gun wavered. It slowed down, a little, matching the train's speed, and even dropped a few meters out of the air, pulled by the gravitational force that was holding it. Even the bullets stopped, the machine's reaction time slowed by the force. With the machine momentarily incapacitated, Vincent raised his gun and fired at what he hoped was the source of its power. The bullets pummeled the front of the machine's chest, denting the metal but not piercing it. Vincent fired again and again, and Red 13 helped by unleashing a powerful stream of flame from his own fire materia. The metal glowed white hot, then snapped with a loud ping. The metal casing fell away, revealing the machine's inner core. A single glass sphere, about the size of a tennis ball, glowed brightly. Mako pulsed through it like a heartbeat. Vincent took aim and fired. One shot was all it took. The glass shattered, and Mako poured out of the open wound, falling like luminescent green blood out of the weapon's body. The eagle gun gave an outraged, almost pain shriek. Red 13 finished the job by letting loose another quick blast of fire, and the machine exploded in a cloud of flame. Hot metal and drops of warm Mako fell through the air, showering them like rain. Sid's spear, thrown clear by the explosion, spun in the air toward them. Red 13 leapt into the air and caught the spear in his mouth, his teeth clamped around it. The gravity materia glowed brightly, and then faded back to its normal glow. The remains of the eagle gun dropped to the ground. A thick cloud of smoke billowed into the air. Vincent sheathed his gun and turned away from the wreckage, which was already beginning to shrink as the train continued on its way. End of Chapter Episode 10, Part 11, Chapter 09 Chapter 9 Only one soldier remained in the front car when Sid, Yuffie, Cat, and Barrett finally reached it. He had remained at his post while his comrades went forth to bring down the rebels. The sound of the wind and the train kept him from hearing what was going on. He heard the eagle gun roar into life, and its screech nearly burst his eardrums. As he heard the gunfire, he relaxed. The rebels would not be able to stand up to firepower like that, he was sure. So he was surprised when he felt a hard tap on his shoulder and turned to see Barrett standing over him. Around him were the other rebels, staring at the soldier with a quiet malice. What they? The soldier gasped, startled. You? You guys. The soldier was horrified. These guys should have been dead by now. Barrett took a step forward. The soldier stepped back warily. The former avalanche leader loomed over him, grinning malevolently. He touched a button on his gun arm, and the chainsaw atop it whirred noisily. The soldier paled beneath his helmet. Sid came forward to stand beside Barrett. All right, he said, his tone sharp. Just hand over the huge materia. The soldier took another step back. The chainsaw on Barrett's gun arm spoke volumes. Desperate, he reached for his rifle. He only managed to fire one shot before he was struck a powerful blow to the stomach. His rifle clattered to the floor as he keeled over, cursing and groaning in pain. 
strong hands then lifted him up into the air and he was thrown over the side of the train. The soldier's cry was cut short as he hit the ground and rolled out of sight. The bullet, thrown off course due to the soldier's terror, widely missed Barrett's head. Sid cracked his knuckles and kicked the fallen rifle to the side of the train. He ran a hand through his blonde hair. You got guts common after me, said the pilot, with an air of satisfaction. I'll never forget you. Got no time for that now, snapped Barrett. Yuffie was leaning over the side of the train. Her face, already pale from probable motion sickness, was ghost white. Forget about the huge materia, she said. It was a statement that, under normal circumstances, would have made everyone faint with shock. The ninja pulled away from the edge. We're in deep trouble. Sid arched an eyebrow and turned to look down the tracks. The train was hurtling through the mountains at an alarming rate. The tracks at this stage were still straight, so there was little danger of them derailing. What was the problem then? Sid raised his eyes and looked further ahead. Up ahead was North Corral. The train was heading straight for the town, and there was nobody left on board who could stop the train. They had just thrown the driver overboard. Ah. So that was the problem. Vincent, back from his battle with the eagle gun, knelt down at the edge of the car. The wind was whipping his hair around his face. He had to raise his voice to be heard over the roaring wind. Hit the brakes, chief. Angered, Sid spun around. I know, already. Just shut up and keep quiet. He turned back to the controls. If we keep this up, we'll crash right into North Corral. Let's see. He inspected the control box. They were more complex than the other train, but they had the same two levers, currently in line with one another. Sid scratched his stubbled chin, thoughtful. If we alternately use the levers to accelerate... He mused, ignoring the impatient muttering coming from Barrett. It should break if we move the levers up or down simultaneously. He took hold of the two levers, grasped them firmly, and then pulled them back. There was a chug and the train sped up. The increase was so sudden that Sid and the others almost fell over and were forced to hold onto the side of the car to keep from falling over. Vincent and Red 13, on top of the next car, had to cling onto the tarpaulin. Hey, it's not working. Barrett shouted to Sid. We're gaining speed. Red 13 howled from the next car. Cat Shi was clinging to the ears of his mog, which had secured itself in the corner of the car. He, however, was having a harder time holding on. Hey wait! He screamed. Other way, other way, other way! The train lurched as it bumped its way over a cluster of rocks littering the track. Yuffie began to retch and sank to her knees. Sid, clinging to the controls, looked up and saw North Corral zooming in fast. Fuck. He swore through gritted teeth. The other way. Just watch, this time I'll... He gripped the levers again and pushed them both to their upward positions. Once again the train's speed increased, and this time they all did fall over. Vincent lost his grip on the tarpaulin and slid back across the tarpaulin. He managed to regain his hold at the edge of the car, and there he held on with all the strength that he could muster. W-H-O-O-O-O-O-A! Red 13 cried. His claws were dug deep into the tarpaulin, and were aching with the strain. Yuffie flashed Sid a furious, wild-eyed gaze. She was still on the floor of the car, her hands holding onto the edge with a death-like grip. Her anger and fear, it seemed, were the only things stopping her from throwing up in the car. Get serious, you old man. Sid was feeling mighty flustered himself. She... His eyes hurriedly scanned the controls, looking for something anything that would stop this blasted train before it smashed into the town, and thereby smashing them up along with it. His fist smashed over the first thing he laid his eyes on, a small, nondescript grey button next to the levers. The horn sounded. Smoke poured out of the funnel, choking the valley with a covering of thick, black clouds. The train began to decrease in speed and all had to cover their ears as the wheels scraped across the tracks. The train slowed and slowed until, finally, it came to a stop before the town of North Corral. The front of the train bumped into the back of a rusty old pickup truck, knocking a spanner off its back. But it could have been much worse. Now stopped, the valves on the side of the train opened, releasing the pent-up steam. Almost like a sigh of relief. Cautiously Sid opened his eyes. In the last moments before the train came to a stop, he had clung to the controls and squeezed his eyes shut. 
Realizing that he wasn't about to be smashed to pieces, he quickly stood up and brushed himself off. Of course the train would stop. There was no need to worry. The others were still rising to their feet. Yuffie managed to make it halfway up before she finally succumbed to her motion sickness and began to throw up over the edge of the train. Cat lumbered over to her and had the mug pat her gently on the back. Red 13 jumped into the control car and padded over to a small metal box in the corner. The box was being held in place through the use of gravity materia, so when the train was chugging along, the box and its contents remained secure. The materia gave the box a purple-black aura, which faded once the materia was removed, making it and its contents accessible. A key had been left in the lock. Red 13 gripped the key between his teeth and turned his head, and there was a click as the box unlocked. Then, with his nose, he pushed the lid open, and everyone gathered around to look. Even Yuffie, still pale and shaky, turned her head. Inside the box was the huge materia, and it was easy to see how it got its name. Most materia, like the ones they used, had been fashioned into the shape of small orbs, easily inserted into things like weapons and armor to give them power. This materia was much larger, more than twice the size of the orbs, and had no definitive shape at all. It was jagged and rough, with multiple sides, as though it had been dug out of the rock. Its color was thick and green, totally opaque, though its sides had a faint shimmer to them. It was reminiscent of the way a gemstone appears when it is first cut from the rocks, and only after careful crafting and polishing does it appear as the beautiful gemstone. No one uttered a word. There were no words that could describe their awe as they looked upon the huge materia. It was no wonder Shinra were so eager to get their hands on it. The power they felt pulsing within it was incredible, a completely different class to the regular materia they used. Sid pulled a handkerchief from his pocket. Carefully, he scooped up the huge materia. It was surprisingly cold to touch, and also surprisingly light. He put it back in the box and locked it again, placing the key in his jacket pocket. Then, carrying his precious cargo under his arm, descended from the train. All the townsfolk had left their shops and homes and were watching with great interest. As Sid and his friends came near, those on the higher levels began to climb down towards the town center. Barrett appeared edgy as they approached the town. You guys are really something. One man said as they passed. They stopped in the town center, and two men from the mid-level came down to meet them. Barrett became more anxious as they approached but he stood firm, refusing to let the memory of his past actions get the better of him. The two men stopped before the group and looked them over. Aren't you the ones that stopped the Shinra train? Asked one of the men, a rotund man who had once been a coal miner. The Shinra was just about to destroy our lives again. The second man, who had a sharp face and features, narrowed his eyes at Barrett. It might be full of junk, but this is the only home we got, Barrett. Barrett was startled as this was directed at him. Of? Of course. He agreed. He met the man's gaze. We're all born and raised in the coal mines. No matter how hard it gets, our hearts burn bright red like coal. He waited to see how his words were taken. The two men shared a glance with each other. The bigger man was smiling broadly. The eyes of the second man softened. He turned back to Barrett and nodded his head. That was enough for them. He waited to see how his words were taken. The two men shared a glance with each other. The bigger man was smiling broadly, and the eyes of the second man softened and he slowly nodded his head. To hell with Meteor! shouted one of the townsmen. We're coal miners, ain't we? We'll dig a deep tunnel and hide from the Meteor. That's it! said the rotund man. He turned his gaze to a brown-haired boy who was stood watching on the mid-level. Hey, kid! How about giving something to these guys fight in the Shinra? The lad nodded and walked down to the lower level. His young face was beaming, filled with excitement. He had never seen anything so thrilling. Fishing about in his pockets, he pulled out a small orb of materia. I got it out of the well. Isn't it an amazing rock? Sid took the materia from the child. The materia was Ultima. He was quite relieved the child had chosen to give them this materia, for who knows what damage he could have done had he figured out how to use it. He smiled at the kid, who beamed further and stepped back to join the adults. The sharp-faced man stepped forward. Must be even a horrific battle. You have scars all over your body. He jerked his thumb to the stone building on the mid-level. I already talked to the inn's owner, today you can rest for free. It was a welcome offer. The battles on the train had indeed worn them out, and their bodies were scratched and bruised from clambering over the cars. Yuffie flashed Sid a challenging glance, daring him to refuse. 
Red 13's stomach growled, he was eager for a meal. Of course it was nearly impossible to tell what Cat and Vincent were thinking, but Sid guessed even they would be glad of a rest before they returned to the high wind. So they remained in North Corral for the rest of that day, until the sun began to make its downward dip into the eastern ocean. They rested up in the inn and ate with the townsfolk, who offered thanks and congratulations at every opportunity. The one who was moved most by it all was Barrett. For long years he had berated and punished himself for what had happened to the people of Corral, the burning of the town, the death of his wife, and that of Dine. He had tried to mask that guilt by attacking the Shinra, vowing to make them pay for what they had done. He still held that vow, but now he knew that to blame himself was fruitless. He could not change the past, but he had changed North Corel's future. The town was saved this time. It was then, as he and the others left North Corel behind and made their way back to the high wind, that Barrett Wallace made another vow. Once Sephiroth was defeated and Shinra had fallen, he would return to North Corel. He would return to that spot where he and Dine had stood overlooking the town as it burned to the ground, where memories and loves went up in flames. And there, in that spot, he would place a bouquet of flowers. In memory of Myrna, of Dine, and Eleanor, the town. And in hope for Marlene's future. Back on the high wind, Sid stood and tapped his head in thought. What's next? He wondered. Shall we head for Fort Condor? The others nodded. Barrett watched North Corel as it slipped out of view, and the high wind turned to the ocean. Of course, he'd be damned if he ever told the others. End of chapter